So uh, thanks very much, uh, everyone. And I have actually a lot of questions, but I want to first uh, <laughs> turn over to the um, audience uh, any questions that you might have, Sarah. Great. Thanks. This was this was terrific, and I loved how just kind of spontaneously the presentations built off of one another. Maybe you planned it, but I sense there was a little bit of spontaneity going on there. Um, I, I, had, I had three comments. Um, I, the first is, uh, I think, relates to a, something Laura said. The notion of publishing all of the results of a, of a study being an obligation. I, principally, I agree with that, but I think one piece of the dialogue that might be missing here, and this goes back to something that was said yesterday, is that the citizen scientists, people who do not do research for a living, may not understand the um, problems with getting published sometimes, like the, the lag time and the, I don't know if there's any journal editors in the room, but that might be a dialogue to, to open up about how can we do more to, if you will, free the data, free the research, free the results. So that was my first point. Um, the second one is about um, this notion of learning from mistakes, which Laura, I think, might have also been a point you made. It struck me as really interesting as scientists were, were you know, there's this, you know, inherently um, they learn from their mistakes in the research context, but in terms of the process context, I think there's still that tendency to keep doing things the way that we've always done them. So there's some humility that's required to say, we didn't do this right the, the first time we had, you know, um, patient advocates joining us or citizen sciences. And I don't know, we don't have a better label yet, Sharon, so I know we're trying to figure out the right word. But, you know, that humility to say, we got to do this better and we want to roll up our sleeves with you. So, I, you know, I hope we'll, we'll get there at some point. And the third point goes to something Denise said about this notion of presenting things in, um, in language that everyone can understand. Work I did at Group Health several years ago showed that writing in plain language is not second nature for scientists. It's like you have to use a different part of your brain to write in a way that is more of a play, uh, an accessible summary. So I thought that there's an opportunity um, where the citizen scientists could contribute on that piece of writing up studies in a way that is more accessible and isn't, you know, kind of the science speak. And so um, I would love thoughts on any or all of those points, the plain language, the learning from mistakes, and how do we kind of surmount this, this um, problem of getting all of the results out into practice in a timely way. So thanks again. So um, I'll just make um, one sort of frame-setting comment, Sarah, and then it would be great to hear from, from everybody on those points. What if we shift the center even in our conversation today, and that is instead of saying, um, you know, I wonder if citizen scientists know that journals' lag time is long, who cares? Let's not have a long lag time. Let's have new journals. Let's have different ways of, of you know, being that part of the system. So we've spent a lot of time, and I think even citizen scientists have spent a lot of time on the research part. Let's also change the after research part. Um, and similarly, um, you know, ha, uh, that scientists would learn about plain language from citizen scientists. Um, let's shift the center again and say that isn't the goal entirely and figure out the way to bring that together. And the other is um, how do we have them join us, meaning join traditional scientists, I, and I'm not picking on you. I know you, that this is fine for you because I know you. Um, but let's shift the center. Like, let's bring the center over to the center and see if we can have yeah. the conversation. Maybe. We'll just call it the Nathan Mullins. Yeah, the Speak. Okay, yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I didn't hold it. Okay, so um, I'm also, thanks for the, those comments. I'm also on the, the board of Community Campus Partnerships for Health, CCPH. And so a lot of what you're talking about, you know, we, we focus a lot, and a part of the reason I'm on the board because the focus are more on the, the C, the community part of the C, and then just moving it more like you were just saying, to really uh, to think about, you know, the different ways of knowing, the different commu community knowledge systems, and it's like just to say they're out there, they're there. And so... It's not like it's what they can do for us. It's like what we need to do as in more collaborative fashion to recognize and value that th those things are already out there. And as far as CCPH, what we do, you know, we've done a lot with our mission statements to, to talk about, you know, authentic, transformative, and equitable partnerships. And what does that mean? And, and you see all this citizen science out there and bringing those principles into play. And then we actually have what we call CES for Health to allow for these other products. So you don't have the lag time. You can publish your protocols. You can publish your photo voice. I do a lot of photo voice, too. I didn't mention that. 
a lot of photo voice, a lot of these other types of, uh, pro, you know, promotors work can be published in CS for, CS for Health, and we're trying to get it, make that another dissemination outlet for this kind of work. So these new journals, we can do it because there are models out there. And another journal is Progress Community Health Partnerships. They actually have a segment in their, their, their articles where it has to be something that's translated. That's that. So, so you have like your regular article, and then the community partner will write their own article to, to go along with with the regular article. So that's another mechanism that just provides sort of a structure and a template that we can use, a model that we can use for this. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I, I think the, the the challenge I think is changing the currency in academia to value CES for Health on the same plane with New England Journal. You know, <laughs> that would be that would be a win. I think that last point you just made is really important because if um, we don't, I, I mean, Silent Spring Institute has made a decision to publish in really high impact journals, and we've done that because uh, not only of the impact in the scientific community, but because that is the way you get on the front page of the LA Times. So I think to say, well, citizen science is going to go this other route can be devaluing and we have to be, uh, it may be that, yeah, we need some other channels, but we also need to really push ourselves and push our skills to get into the high impact channel. So, I, as someone going up a tenure, tenure promotion, <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> okay. If someone going for tenure promotion, the point you just made is very important. Uh, and the point you made is very important. Most of my work is not published in New England Journal. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not, a, I'm not an epidemiologist. So for general public health and environmental health, our basic impact factors between one and three. EHP is 7.92 or 7 point, whatever, NIHS, y'all know what it is. But uh, <laughs> you know, that's the highest for environmental health. So you have to have these other channels because the work is not being, if it's not being counted, if, if Thomas Reuter doesn't invite you in to the Good Old Boy Network with your journal, then you're not going to get an impact factor. Progress Community Health Partnerships is the best journal, for, I think, for CPPR. It has no impact factor. Environmental Justice, I'm on the board of environmental, uh, editorial board for environmental justice. We're a subset within a subset within a subset of environmental health. It has no impact factor. Most of my papers in journals, they either have low impact factor or no impact factor. Does not mean that that work is not valuable, right? Does that mean that work is not valid? It means that the system that I'm in does not value the work, right? It only values, it, sh it only values New England Journal, it only values JAMA, it only values science. And if you don't get into that, then you're not a good scientist. No, that means you're not taking into account the scientific inquiry. Remember the five dimensions, the, the commodification, the first dimension? You're not, that's where all the value is. It's not in the, the other dimensions of engagement. It's not in translation. It's not in, you know, it's not in uh, teaching. It's not been transdisciplinary, right? So we have to push the whole system to be better. I think, I think that's a big point. We have to push the system. And I think, I think citizen science is a paradigm that's pushing the system. And we need to provide those outlets so that work can be seen in ways that, even with popular media, that we can do more using social media. And citizen science is disruptive technology. And so we need to see it as that and basically support it in that way, right? So I'm a rubber meets the road kind of girl. <clears throat> and um, Shakobi, it seems like the, the real value is how the, the, the people in that community is impacted, yep. bottom line. Um, as far as um, plain language and simple language, um, one of the things that I um, did for several years is train um, new docs how to write their first clinical trial protocol. So, um, and this happened in a group situation um, uh, over a summer. It was like protocol camp. So, um, the th there's lots of tools out there. There's lots of tools online. Um, even in your Word document, you can go in and, and, and do that to get a reading level. Um, so, there's simple tools. There's lots of tools. It's just getting it down to the level where everyone can use them. Yeah. yeah. No, actually, I was ripping, bringing that up because actually, not shameless plug time, but um, we, I did actually work on a readability toolkit that's freely available. Great. Um, so I agree with you, but I think it was just we had so much trouble getting the traction for it. Right. Um, the people didn't think they needed it. They knew how to write. You know. So I have Pearl, Sally, and then Mildred. Hi, um, Pearl O'Rourke. 
I think that um, I'd love to hear comments from the panel and the audience on this dissemination of results in that I think this is all research. This is not a citizen science issue. Um, and I think there's this issue of responsible dissemination. Um, and yeah, there's obviously issue, there's concerns um, or there's initiatives going on, the U EU now requiring or promising they're going to require um, individual level data to be publicly available, huge issues about privacy, you know, what do pe are people going to want to be in research because of that, um, issues about having summaries that are not promotional, who is going to write that, um, concerns about the context, it's one study, how does that you know, compare to the other 10 studies on the same thing. Um, is this the hallmark study or is this the one rogue study that no one should look at? Um, I think the power of blogging is a little bit scary at times. Um, some of the uh, websites that we have been asked to look at that are both resources for advocacy groups as well as recruitment tools, very difficult, which is which, so we've had to like paw through an awful lot of what the research piece is, or the resource piece is. And it's a little scary that it's a study totally out of context. So my concern is this, that generally, I mean, if Elsie wants to take this on as an issue, this is not a citizen science issue. I think responsible, timely, and contextual dissemination is something that we are lacking in across the board. Um, just a comment and a whine. I'm sorry. <laughs> can I, can I, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm taking over your moderator role. But um, my friend Deb has spent quite a bit of time on um, writing study, salt resum study result summaries. And so she's raising her hand too, so. Well, I was just going to say there are some efforts in that. And I, it could definitely be an LC issue and something that, um, the ELSI community could get more involved in. But for example, the Harvard uh, Multi-Regional Clinical Trial Group, MRCT, uh, had this last year as one of their projects, Return of Results. And I was one of the co-chairs of that group. And we've, uh, so there's a guidance document and toolkit that's going to be um, publicly available, I think, next month. We're in the final draft of it right now. So, um, you know, there are, there are, efforts going on and, and they address the EMA uh, issues and requirements and there was a multi-stakeholder group involved in that. So that's something, and I agree, it's not for this meeting, but um, I just wanted to bring that up because it's an incredibly important part of what we're discussing now. So there are efforts that I think the LC community could join and that would be important. About what? About um, plain language study results on this, <coughs> getting that on all studies in all phases from all sponsors. And as far as context, I can um, envision this as part of, um, say, the informed cons uh, um, consent document for the NCI um, has a required section on what is the usual care and why is this study being done. So there are contextual um, pieces in there that that help to, yeah. No, I mean, I agree we do it in pieces. When I was thinking context, I'm more, it's updating. It's hard enough when you're even very interested in a very discrete type of research to keep track of how it is evolving over time. I see. And it's that context that, um, that I think is difficult. I don't know, maybe impossible. And it needs huge resources. Um, this is something that's really central to my interests and work. So um, I'm thinking about it in the context of environmental chemicals and body burden and what's in your house. And uh, this issue that the knowledge will evolve is actually one of the reasons that we felt it was important to report to people on their personal exposures. Uh, and uh, you, you also asked about context, so I'm going to say that first and then come back to to the evolving knowledge. So I think it's, it's a profound responsibility of the collaborative science team, which may, in citizen science contexts, um, be kind of uh, large, 
um, to to grapple with those questions of context and provide that knowledge when they report results. When you give people's own, when you give people their results, that enables them in some way to keep keep up as the knowledge evolves. In the case of environmental chemicals, so. Uh, in, in the past, it was common ethical practice to report to people only if their um, blood level exceeded a clinical guideline. But there are no clinical guidelines for any of the chemicals that we study. Uh, and in fact, the clinical guidelines have changed for lead. They keep, just keep going down. So one of the reasons that we decided to report results fully is so that people would have access to this information in the future as knowledge about the implications evolved. Um, we, we're trying to figure out now what is the responsibility of the team to keep in touch with people. We did have, an, we did have a situation in one of our studies where uh, there was no guideline and then a guideline came, came in. Um, you know, it's not like the lead guideline, which is a clinical guideline. It's a, it's a environmental health guideline, but we did end up reporting to those people a second time when the guideline uh, came in. Okay, I have Sally Mildred, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, Nancy, Carol, Eric, and then Sandra. So Sally? Wow, I feel fortunate because, <laughs> um, you know, I, one of the things that concerns me, and I really appreciate the conversation, it's been a, a very enriching. But one of the things that I, I'm concerned about, and maybe NIH needs to take this into consideration, is just how little funding is focused on that phase of the research. So, and I'm going to add a couple more here, and I think maybe we need to be calling for, and it, it isn't just about citizen science, obviously, but I think when you start to engage the public, then there's certain expectations that rise, and I think those go to justice. I think there's sort of senses of social and, and uh, ethical components of this that are really important. So it goes beyond uh, just disseminating results. It goes to implementation of those, uh, what the next steps are, but also two more that I really think are important when you start engaging the public more robustly, and that's scalability and sustainability. I am not a research scientist by background. I'm a clinician mainly in the community, and I can tell you how frustrating it is to see research applied within a community setting um, only to find it fall short because you can't sustain it. So, you know, there are demonstration projects that look great, and their first three years they go robustly well, and then suddenly you've got everybody kind of excited in the community about it, and then you can't keep it going. So I, I think there's a responsibility to start thinking about, you know, how can we maintain the, um, the robustness of the project um, in some way in action steps that actually the community can look at and say, that's what we did. That's how it worked, and this is what we're doing now as a result. That evolution of knowledge, I think, is really important. So I think NIH should step that up. I think we need to have some more dedicated understanding of what does it mean and how does, what's the cost, who does it, um, where it, and some of it may be people in the public who are doing it, and they may need to get something in uh, return for that action. So uh, that would be my soapbox. Um, I just wanted to... Um Say, I, you know, I totally agree, and I think the other thing that funders often don't pay for, although they may even have it in a funding announcement, is the community engagement process and even developing uh, the research question or the design. Um, you know, it's, you get this funding announcement, you're supposed to respond in 60 days with something that you've um, used a CBPR approach with. I mean, that, that just doesn't, that just doesn't work. Um. Yeah, so uh, I, I agree. and. Um, it's really interesting, so I mentioned some of the work that, you know, done with Ware and with uh, Lamsey, so the output of Lamsey was sea crab. So the sustainability part was this organization that will move forward with a lot of the work that we've done in the, in the project. And another part of that was, you know, we, we wanted to, we, we really wanted to, to, to provide more funding, so, so as all the panelists talked about this whole capacity issue. And so we've had these discussions with NIH and also NIHS over the years about, you know, having different types of grants. That, and it's not just on NIH, of course, but as a, as a, as a board member of CP, CCPH, we talk about our peeps, the people who are our customers. And NIH is a customer for us because it's a partner. And so any federal agency, any foundation that's providing funding, they have to be at the table to understand the whole structure and, and what's the, you know, what's sort of the continuum, right? And so as it relates to the continuum, there's no funding for, for some of the continuum. 
And so what happens is, you, as you said, you have this, this excitement, and then you're left with limited resources have been extracted out of in-kind support from the partners, and it ends up, could end up messing with the trust, particularly when you use a CBPR paradigm. And so I think more needs to be done. And I know NIH had a dissemination, wasn't a dissemination conference or institute a few years ago, uh, or was it a year ago or two years ago? So I think that's, we need to go more into that as it relates to dissemination, but again, the translation to action and sustainability. And you ask for it in the grant, but then you want, we put it in the grant, and then there's nothing there to go, you know. And, and, and to get to your point, uh, Denise, about um, community engagement, one good thing that the EPA has done recently uh, for all of their STAR grants, there has to be a community engagement plan that goes with their STAR grants now. And they also in the process of trying to modify the peer review process to make sure more community members actually under the peer review process. So CCPH was involved in helping the EPA do some of this. And so you have, again, these examples of how we can move forward with changing our structure and our processes. But I think that sustainability funding, different types of grants are needed. And, and we, we have to make sure that it's just not the short-term R03 or R21 and it goes away. We got some results. We pile it. Hey, hip, hip, hop, hooray. You know, we were happy about it and it's gone again. And then five years later, we get an institute director change and we go back to it. It's like, you know, I'm seeing my tail again. Why well, am I in this circle? We, we have to get out of that circle of, you know, a process. Um, so. Can I, just one follow-up thing on that. Uh, my expectation would not be that NIH takes that on completely. I think that there's a requirement of creative collaboration in the assessment and planning of the grant itself that says who are our, our future collaborators that will help us keep this going. And it may be that it's just other funding sources. It may be that it's community resources and things like that. But just so that no one thinks I think NIH should take all that on, but they should have expectations about it. Yeah, my comment was actually, um, just in complete agreement with all of those things about dissemination, because I actually think that NIH has a lot of leverage here. Um, I mean, as you say, they always ask for that little section in the grant at the end about dissemination, and there isn't any funding, and nobody ever does it. But um, in uh, Canadian grants that I review, they have a much more robust section on um, knowledge translation, which includes the translation to action that you talk about and so forth. And it is much more part of the budget. It's more part of the actual part of the, it is part of the research to, to, it's not looking at it as after the research. Um, and I think NIH not only can do a lot more to actually sort of, you know, put the money where the mouth is there, but also um, that it is absolutely an LC issue that is not unique to any particular research. I mean, it is actually unconscionable that all this money is being spent and more than half of clinical trials are never published. And in fact, more than half of clinical trials never accrue a single patient. And how that gets perpetuated, why are we still funding the same people to not publish their research and not, you know, I, I don't know how that's happening, but that's, I, I don't see why NIH can't do something about that. And maybe funding needs to change as well. Nancy. Nancy Jones, um, National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. Um, I wanted to go back to some of the models of, of um, Mr. Wilson, where you had like the different types of uh, what you saw science doing and then the last part, you know, like really linked to advocacy or using data to rule, right, um, getting to the point that you, you move it. But um, bringing it back to the LC2 is that there's also conflicts in roles. And, um, you know, one of the things that we do, you know, like in the epistemology of science or how we know what we know, how we believe that we know, I think um, Pearl sort of talked about the difference between one study and a body of knowledge and, you know, how, when, we, when is it actionable. Um, but then there's also the concern of objectivity, you know, that uh, when, you know, when you really want to use data to rule, to make decisions and to be actionable, then you, you are biased. In, and so then, you know, that puts science in tension. But, but there's a difference between, you know, like hypothesis or making links uh, versus when it's more diagnostic or, you know, the body of knowledge can support now, you know, like what is it at the local community? So it's at a later stage. So there's, 
So I guess what I'd like to do too is that when you think about those different models, I think then there are different constraints um, where, you know, like earlier in the process, it's really even more important to have, you know, actually, you know, constraints in there to keep it more objective, like peer review and where you get later in the process and it's consistent with the body of knowledge and then you can have a different role in putting it more in action. You know, there you're more concerned with the technical precision. Was it done and consistent with the, the science or the techniques that were there? But like for me though, I like how you tried to come up with different phases of where you see it being used. But I think, you know, understanding what the, the constraints on you know, like the citizen is in those different places, you know, is important um, to be able to use the data in such a way that you don't, you don't get yourself in a bind. Because, you know, all of us know in science, it's really easy to get blinded to your own theories. Um, and so I just wanted to put that out there. No, no those are good points. I mean, I think when I, when I talk to my students about objectivity in sciences, there's no objective scientists. You know, we all have biases. I mean, you know, I grew up in a community near a sewage treatment plant. My dad worked at the Grand Gulf Nuclear Power Station. He worked at coal fire plants. You know, that's why I do what I do. I mean, that's not, that's, that drives me. You know, that's my lived experience. So your lived experiences really inform what you do. And then, you know, I, but I think your point about peer review is important, but then who are the peer reviewers? Right, because I mentioned my previous comment, we need to have more community members who are the contextual experts as peer reviewers. I do not live in your community. I do research. I'm a I'm an outsider who goes in and do research. I still go back home to my home in Bowie where there's none of those concerns. Right, community members are dealing with it every day. So as a contextual expert, they need to be peer reviewing this research to make sure that it's valid, it's representative, that is that is actually going to be useful. Uh, so I think the utility component is important. And so, I, but I do think, you know, there, there are things that can be done as we go through the different phases, and also across that continuum of community engagement, where we have, you know, roles and responsibilities defined, but again, there has to be sort of this give and take process of a, so, because your role and responsibility can change as a citizen scientist, and also as a collaborator on those projects. Some projects I facilitate, some I'm just there for technical assistance, right? And so one of the models that I didn't mention that we use so we have sort of this Comer is one model is sort of the the, so the whole data the, the data research ownership process. It's another model that we use uh, called collaborative problem solving, which is really is about the translation to action. So we end up having work groups. So we we have a health work group. We have a sort of revitalization work group. We have a policy work group. And so these work groups take the data and they use it right and they collaborate and they work with other partners in the community to figure out how the data can be used for action. So we use that structure in helping us. Uh, uh, Think about solutions and implement solutions. Can you move to a microphone? Um, anyway, I'm loud. Um, so just a, just a, an observation, NCI currently has a clinical trial just focusing on exceptional responders. Those are people who had an exceptional response in a a, a study drug that otherwise didn't make it. And so tracking down these people has been horrendous because basically the clinical trials are never published when the results are negative. And so I think we've hit on a, a really kernel issue here where even though it's not unique to citizen science, citizen scientists could play a huge role in getting these results out. Maybe not in the New England Journal, but that's the beauty of, you know, citizen scientists aren't looking for promotions and tenure. So I think there's a real role here for citizen scientists in conjunction with NIH to see that these kinds of trials get published because we're using taxpayer dollars to fund the same study over and over and over again. Yeah, the only comment I'll make there is um, I think we tried to invite uh, Sarah Green, different Sarah Green, from, uh, from Rapid Science, and she's making an attempt to do that. Again, way underfunded efforts. Um, the other piece that will be very interesting, and, and actually I'm going to leave it to Kelly Edwards after 1 o'clock, since this is being webcast, uh, to give you the, the summary of the IOM report. But these are exactly the issues we deliberated around sharing publishing negative results, publishing clinical trial data, et cetera, for a year, and listened to everybody, and then wrote recommendations that I think people will be really excited about. Um, and, and those are exactly the kinds of things that we're looking for there. So I have next Eric. Uh, yes, Eric Brown, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, I can't help but feel the, the, the there, 
the, from lots of the comments um, being made, the, I just hear the inherent conservatism of science and sort of recognizing that, whether it's in reward structure, whether it's in publication, whatever it is, I mean, that, that and, and this to me speaks more to the, uh, the, the fact that we're all biased agents than anything else, right? So we do the kinds of studies that get us the kinds of results that results in us further, furthering our career. I, again, not to impugn the, 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 the altruistic goals that come from, that are, are deep in the, in, in, the, in the psyche of many scientists, but still, this is what folks do. And what don't you publish? You don't have some great results for a drug that you don't publish. No, that stuff gets published. So it makes sense that these things wouldn't happen. And part of what I hear, and, and I thought this yesterday, and, and um, I don't remember who it was. Maybe it was Holly, who's the, are you, the, is, she, is she the genetic counselor? There's someone, Holly, yeah. yes, and, and I immediately made the connection between her as a genetic counselor and from a, a, the a other workshop I was at on civic science where they had lots of folks who were cooperative extension agents. And that in some ways they operate in this same sort of organizing translatory space. And that what seemed to be coming to me, or what I keep hearing, is that we need more of these kinds of folks who aren't researchers in the traditional sense, who aren't community members in the traditional sense, but folks who operate in that in-between space and who manage those relationships, understanding that there is a continuum and that you might inhabit different roles, but that, that there's a richness to, to having people who can maintain the continuity of effort in those in-between spaces, and that perhaps this is something that funding agents should understand is important, that we need folks who can do that and that they should be paid for. And similarly, that universities should understand that these kinds of people are extraordinarily important and that we should educate them to understand that this is a role, that this is a real role in the science of the 21st century. Not just citizen science, I would argue, but science more broadly. That getting the results to the regular folk, even if you're in a traditional kind of uh, research setup, is extraordinarily important. Because as someone said, we do pay billions of dollars for this sort, sort of stuff. So I, citizen science and the other civic science efforts, I think, are really are pushing the natural innate conservatism of science and the, and the mechanisms of science. And we need to listen to those, those kinds of pushes and figure out if there are really innovative ways that we can, or to, to, to give more support to the innovative ways of, of expanding that and looking at the models that have worked and are working, like genetic counseling, like the cooperative extension agents, and seeing what lessons we can learn from those translators. Thank you for being an advocate's advocate. <laughs> um, those are part of the, the relationships that I was talking about, that, you know, we do have a place at the table where we're not worried about what's going to be published, where we're not worried about whose toes we're going to step on because, you know, I may have to work with him or her sometime down the road um, on any given project or, you know, I'm going to blow your tenure structure or whatever. So. Um, yeah, thank you for those comments. I, Can I ask you just sure. a, one quick follow-up? How do I, as an advisor to lots of students and a teacher of lots of students, though, convince a student that your role is a role that they can inhabit and make a career of for themselves? Because that's not how you came to the role that you inhabit. But right. I can see many of my students for whom that role would be an awesome one. You know, it's a perfect place for them to live and marry their different interests. But then figuring out where the place for them is in the larger sort of edifice of science is harder to figure out how to, how to instruct them how to, how to make a life for themselves there. Well, I, I do, the, the roads in, inward are many. Um, I do want to correct one thing that this is not my career. Mm -hmm. This is an avocation. This is something I do, you exactly. know, right. from, from the heart, yeah. and and ninety nine point nine percent of my time is volunteer, so um, uh, there are many ways to get involved. 
um, directly uh, talking to somebody in the field that they are interested in. And, um, pos I, you know, the, the other members of the, the panel can speak to that. But um, uh, I got involved uh, with an online um, chat group that, or a listserv that, that were comparing research studies just in the specific type of leukemia that I have. And so out of that grew, I thought I was going to have a, a backyard gr uh, barbecue with people from, there are 3,000 members in this group, but I thought, you know, in a, in a smaller community in the central Ohio area, well, that grew to 100 people. And then two years later, that grew to 200 people. So it, it's amazing to me how people come into this. But I think even a conversation with somebody um, who might be a leader in the field um, is a great, a great inroad, even just asking questions. So this is yeah, one way. Yeah, so I think you make some really important points. And it's interesting, you're asking in what field. I mean, you, you do have, for me, one of the disciplines, departments would be, at least in public health, would be health behavior, health education, because that's where you get the MPH, and that's what people have been trained, you know, they're, that would be the, the first place where students could go to get a degree, at least from a public health perspective. But then the cooperative extension a point you make, I think is really important because I, we have, you know, University of Maryland, we have a cooperative extension, and they do a lot of work. You have co-op extension agents in every county. I think part of the problem I've seen with the, with the structure at, at Maryland is, is it's really still that traditional model. And so they haven't taken, and yet you had to think about it, you know, uh, um, George Washington Carver played a major role in the cooperative extension, you know, uh, what it is today. And so that's infrastructure that could be leveraged and expanded upon that we need to use more of. And I think, you know, NIH has a science communication fellowship program, right? So those types of, because you're talking about science communication, science translation, being that glue when the project ends and being the person who helps this, the next project begin, right? I think there's, again, those, that, those could be fellowship programs that get funded. You could have a training grant, an NIH training grant that would go to institutions just to do that type of thing. So again, being creative, thinking out of the box and saying, what are the models we already have? And just provide more resources for those models. So I think uh, Sima wants to jump in here. Then I have Sandra and Effie next. Thank you, Sharon. Sima Finn, NIEHS. I wanted to address this incredibly important issue about the sustainability of projects. And that the environmental health scientists in the room know that we do include language on that, and it's a review criteria in our programs about community engagement. I would encourage the other NIH people to consider making that a review criteria, making that a requirement in any project that involves human populations. But it comes, it, I'm going to throw it back in the researcher's court, and, and this goes to your comment about conservatism. This speaks to that research with communities are not equal partnerships if the budget is not given to the parts of the project that serve the community. And that that is something that is the scientist in this atmosphere where their careers are dependent on their research and sometimes their tenure at the school depends on their level of funding. It's a sacrifice to make a part of the budget for the community, for sustainability, um, but if you require it in funding announcements, you require it be a budgetary commitment, you require that key personnel include community members and they get paid, that begins to equalize this. And I think that is something that we can do at NIH and it is something we do at NIHS very often. And I would like to see it spread a little more. And that is one way to ensure sustainability is you have people propose what is their plan for sustainability, which also includes identifying other sources of funding. Thank you. Uh, comments. And I was struck, um, Julia, by your comment that your NIEHS grant was a social justice grant, was pivotal uh, in seeding a lot of the activity. Um, and you said that they didn't require a hypothesis, they didn't require preliminary data. I wonder if you could share a little bit about what lessons are learned about thinking about out of the box in terms of funding mechanisms and also what 
uh, different um, ideas around metrics of success in terms of the renewal. So, for example, I'm just thinking about Sokobi's comments about, um, you know, building a research infrastructure within a community as potentially a metric of success or um, this translation into policy action, even at the local context. Um, could that be a metric for success in terms of sustaining uh, funding? And also, whether you needed a traditional institutional partner. Can this happen uh, simply by the community themselves? That's a really great set of questions. I hope I remember them all. <laughs> um, uh, don't let me forget that last one in particular. Um, so. I was thinking last night, actually, that maybe citizen science and community questions tend to be descriptive. That this, like, that we, the idea that, you, that we didn't have a hypothesis to start with, it's not like we didn't have any scientific ideas or any theories that we were working from. Um, we were working from the idea that endocrine disruptors might affect breast cancer risk. But that was 20 years ago, and that was a very new idea. And in California, we were working from the idea that we might or might not be able to document chemicals from the refinery inside homes in a way that would show that the outdoor air monitors that were being used in the regulatory process were inadequate. So you wouldn't call any of those things a scientific hypothesis. But they were descriptive questions that were science-based. Um, and, you know, the whole Human Genome Project and a lot of astronomy is descriptive. So I, I think citizen science maybe inherently opens the view to this kind of research um, in interesting ways. And, okay, so then your next question was sort of related to that. But where, uh, so then what are the, what are the metrics? Um, well, I, I think uh, NIEHS actually has a really cool manual on metrics for community-based participatory research that includes uh, a range of, of uh, outcomes. I think it's really important to include policy change. Um, and I also think that uh, dissemination through the news media and social media, we need metrics on that to be counted and important along with scientific publication. My own view, as I said earlier, is that scientific publication is a foundation for news media outreach. So, um, and it's important to remember that. Um, the, and, and in a way, the capacity building then proves itself. So for us as an institute, you know, you know, it would be kind of maybe it would seem silly to report as an outcome of your grant, wow, we learned how to manage the finances of a federal grant. But, <laughs> you know, that gave us courage to apply for another one. <laughs> um, and. Uh, it gave us courage to support other organizations to apply for them, too. So then we won the grant, and then that becomes the metric. Uh, we did have partners. Uh, one of, but one of the things that was transformative was that uh, Shoba Srinivas and the program officer, by encouraging us to be the principal investigator, at that time the money wasn't split. It all went through us. And that meant everybody was accountable to us. Uh, and uh, that grant included researchers uh, then at, who were then at Brown University, UC Berkeley, and Communities for a Better Environment. It's not that easy to make academics accountable to you. I have a grant right now where that's an issue. But it's very different from when the money gets split down the middle and there are grants to each entity. Um, we issued subcontracts that described our expectations. We chaired all the meetings, um, although now we've got like a rotating, um, more collaborative, perhaps, um, structure. Uh, people had to come to our space. Um, 
And a lot of those things turned out to just make a lot of difference in how the project ran. Uh, so then your, your last question was, could we, ha could we do it without our partners? And I think that is something that would be, as, uh, as an executive director and thinking about a strategic plan, uh, I am thinking about whether we should try to become the lead on a center. And like right now, NIH isn't prepared to make, to let us win. But, but maybe it should be. And I, I think that could be um, very powerful. Uh, I'm, I'm trained. I have a, you know, I have a fancy education. Some of my staff does, some doesn't. But uh, I have learned in my experience that where you sit really does matter. And the social scientists in the room shouldn't have any trouble believing that. Um, so even though I have a fancy education, the fact that I sit outside the university makes the work that I do different. I am, I am mission accountable to my board of directors and to my constituency. And I think uh, it could be really, really great to have some NIH centers that are led outside a university. I just wanted to build on that a little bit. Um, one mechanism that um, maybe people may or may not know about in this room is there's a mechanism in NIH called the Native American Research Centers for Health. And this is perhaps a model that could be used with other um, funding announcements <laughs> where um, the requirement is that um, the, a tribal entity or a tribe is the lead applicant um, and that they may partner with an academic institution, um, but the requirement actually is that most of the money goes to the tribe or the tribal health organization. Uh, so that's kind of one thought. Um, the other thought that I, um, oh, I totally forgot my other thought. <laughs> maybe, I'll, maybe I'll pick up on it. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. You got it. Yeah, I forgot. <laughs> So, no, uh, these, those are really good comments, and I, I appreciate your question because uh, with CCPH, we've been pushing, it's been advocates for, you know, uh, funding mechanisms that go to communities. So when you say the word community, we all come from a community. Why is this sort of a stereotype of the community doesn't know what they're doing? They have many people, professionals, who live in communities. We all live in a community. <laughs> So why is this a stereotype about, I mean, it's like this natural, y'all can't even run. I mean, I don't understand that. So, it, so that's, been, that's like one sort of point. And one sort of quick sort of funny situation was in with my, with, with Omega Wilson was president, we're not related, uh, of WERA. We submitted a, a R01 grant when I was a grad student. And we got comments back. There's no way the community group wrote this grant. Right, Steve? Was this 2002? I was a PhD student. Chris was a master's student. Oh, we wrote a grant and we got, how rude and disrespectful that they assumed that this is academic, these professors were faking like they were community. And that was the review. It was an NIH, NIHS grant we submitted in 2002. It was a great grant. And so this is the kind of things that you have to overcome when you have a community who takes the lead because it's just biased, it's assumptions that community cannot, and we know that's not true. You know, but I think there's been this ongoing discussions about Changing the mechanisms. Again, it's not all on NIH, as one of the attendees has said, but that NIH, federal agencies, foundations like the Northwest Foundation, I think Funds Community, or Kresge Foundation, or Boyd Johnson, they have to be the ones to change the way things are done. Taxpayers' money is being used, and we're not seeing value out of the outputs of a lot of these projects. There has to be more scientific accountability. There has to be more science democracy. Citizen science is a part of that. And NIH has the opportunity with other funders to be the lead to change how things are done. So people like me, folks behind me, who are doing great work when it comes, when it comes to team promotion, a third of what I do is not counted. Because even though the university said it's valuable, schools of public health say we love social justice and addressing health disparities, in the end, it's not counted. It is not counted. So funders have to change that. So we can have more students, like the, I think the ones that Eric mentioned, who want to do this work, but their career opportunities are not out there because it's not valued and the university is not funding those positions. So there's ways for that to happen, but I think these larger players have to make, be a major driver to make institutions change the way they do things. I did get permission to go over a little, so we're going into a lightning round. So we'll ask, <laughs> we'll ask the questioner to make the question short and people to make their answers short. I'm long-winded, sorry. 
<laughs> and if people could turn off their microphones, because only three can be on at once. So Effie, and then Elizabeth, and then we're done. OK, mine is a quick comment. I just uh, wanted to mention one initiative, which seems to me an interesting evolution in some of the stuff we're talking about. The BMJ, which is a high-impact um, medical journal, has an initiative in place since last year where anything you send there, research, um, analysis, or whatever, is also reviewed by patients. So it has a parallel review from the scientific experts, or whoever, medical experts, and patients. I thought that's an interesting idea. We'll see how it goes. It's new. And maybe there are other journals that I'm not aware of, but in that sort of high impact level, this is the one. But my question maybe to the panel more um, is, I do like the idea of that sort of evolution, this integration of, of citizens and patients in what it gets recognized as scientific knowledge we need, you know, to, um, to, to we, we can use. Um, do you think there is a risk in having knowledge produced by citizen science being considered as, you know, not up there if it has its own separate channel of dissemination, um, of assessment and all, you know, all this? And where would you see, because that's something I would say we have to avoid. Um, but do you see any ways, do you have any suggestions of how we can actually integrate those, those systems and have a one way of assessing what constitutes good science that, you know, we can all share, no matter whether you're in the scientific establishment or outside of this? Fast answers, anybody? <laughs> <laughs> we need to... I, I think we've heard a little bit uh, about impact um, uh, um, from Sacobi and, and also Julia, I think, talked about how to m create metrics, and um, I guess uh, uh, NIEHS has some metrics, so I think you're right that that's a piece we're going to have to put together. Elizabeth's going to have the last word, and then we're going to uh, adjourn for break. That's a lot of pressure. Um, so there, there is a, I, I think we need some guiding principles. Um, we, uh, in the climate justice movement, use the HEMIS principles for democratic organizing. I would suggest that everybody read them, believe them, use them, incorporate them, because I, I, what, I, what I'm feeling is that there needs to be a cultural shift. And um, as we're trying to sort of uh, take apart um, years and years and years of, um, uh, of, of a structure, uh, that that guarantees certain results, um, and, and and the challenge for those of us that are in the community um, is that we don't just deal with science. We're dealing with law. We're dealing with agencies. We deal with a lot of different issues because our communities exist in an interdisciplinary frame, and they are dealing with so many kinds of challenges that science is just one piece of everything else. That's why most of us have never taken an environmental policy class, even though we change uh, environmental policy every day, uh, because we are these generalists that are there to facilitate community power and transformation. And so, um, and so that cultural shift has to happen um, everywhere, and it's happening in a lot of different spaces, and it has to happen in this space, too, so you need to have those guiding principles. Um, you know, I hear communities talked about a lot, and for me it always is, what does that mean for communities of color and leadership of color specifically? The reality is that foundations don't fund leadership of color at the same levels as they fund white leadership. If you're white and you are doing a study on the work that I have done, you're going to get a grant that is three times the size of the grant that I receive. And that's true. That's been well documented that there is discrimination in funding. And so as we're looking about uh, looking at the change in demographics and we're looking at urban areas that are going to become bigger, where there are going to be more public health disparities, there has to be more an investment in leadership of color that is addressing those issues that affect their community because it is going to be really serious. Of course, I always talk about climate change. Somebody called me the um, the Climate change, alleluia, all right? I said, all right, I could handle that. Uh, I'll take it, I'll take it. Um, so, so I say that we've had conversations with Kresge. We've talked to Kresge about the fact that the big greens get all of the funding and that climate adaptation and resilience has to happen on the ground, that that, that has to be, f and they're looking at that. And we're meeting with funders who are looking at thinking about funding and supporting organizations on a grassroots in a very different way. 
So, um, so there's a lot of folks that are thinking about this, and I, and we know that it's hard, and we know that it's challenging, uh, but I think that given what is ahead of us, that we have to start thinking about these issues in a very different way. And so, anyway, I'm going to stop right there because I, I, I feel like I've lost my way. Um, and I, I, I don't want you to call me an alleluia. I mean, I've had enough. <laughs> Elizabeth, that. that was that was fabulous. And I'll just end this panel by saying uh, I think my recommendation for ELSI work at NIH would be for ELSI to turn the ELSI tools on the NIH and the way that it works in the world is a very practical thing. All right. Thank you so much. I just want to set up the next session because when we thank you for that awesome panel and comments. Um, I just want to set us up for our next session when we come back from break because we're all going to move and it's going to be super disruptive because you guys are all comfortable and spread out and everything else. So pack up your stuff now because when we come back we're going to sit down in our new assigned small groups and here's what the tables look like. So you all have your grid, your sheet of where you've been assigned. So we're just going to go in a big U like this, where that front table where Pearl and uh, Elaine are right now, that's table number, that's A. My table back here, and we're all going to move. So the, the facilitators are tagged with their own tables. These are just for letters. So that t up front table is table A, back table is B, middle back table is C, uh, side table here with Deborah and Rich is uh, D, and front table where Sarah is, is E. Okay? E, D, C, B, A. And so find your uh, table when you come back. So that means we're all moving. So have a good uh, work. And please come back at 10. We got a 20-minute break instead of half hour. They do have coffee upstairs. Thank you. <laughs>